Welcome to the ABA and PT podcast, where I interview scientists and practitioners from the world of precision teaching and behaviour analysis and share their journeys of how they found their way to the science of behaviour, as well as their discoveries through the use of the standard acceleration chart. I'm Mandy Mason, a scientist practitioner in Perth, Australia, impacted by my daughter with autism, who caused me to knock on enough doors to find my way to this extraordinary field. And I'm on a journey to share how precision teaching and the use of the standard acceleration chart can change the world and make it a better place to live. I'm managing to combine my two great loves of sprinting and working with kids and still getting away with it. It is my absolute delight to welcome Dr. Abigail Corkin to episode one of the ABA and PT podcast. When I decided to relaunch this podcast, my goal was to go back and tell the story of how precision teaching developed as a field and who were some of the preeminent people to have left a footprint and contributed a huge knowledge bank on the use of the standard acceleration chart to inform and make decisions. When I asked Dr. Bob Washam, who might be willing to undertake this journey with me, he said there would be no better person to launch the podcast than Abigail Corkin. So when I asked and she said yes, I was beyond excited to bring her journey and contribution to this audience. You can find Abigail's life's work at www.abigailbcorkin.com. Dr. Corkin was born in Boston and grew up in New England and New York City and has lived in New Hampshire, Maine, Nova Scotia, Colorado, Scotland, Oregon, Kansas, Washington, and now resides in a coastal town of Alaska, where it's not unusual for her to encounter a black bear on her way back to her main house after a day of riding. This lady gets around and epitomizes the words brave and bold. She has a double major in psychology and philosophy from the University of Colorado, a master's in special education under Barbara Bateman from the University of Oregon, and a PhD in educational administration and school psychology from the University of Kansas under Dr. Alton Lindsley. Today, she shares her journey from an early near-death experience to the field of special education and precision teaching in episode one of this two-part podcast. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Abigail Corkin to talk about her extraordinary life. Well, it is my great privilege today on the rebrand of my podcast to welcome a lady by the name of Abigail Corkin. And this is a massive honour for me, Abigail, to uh, welcome you to the podcast and for you to agree to do my first episode. I feel like I kind of won the lottery and... I just couldn't be happier to have you here today to talk about your journey, all the extraordinary things that happen in your life. And this is kind of the second time we caught up and talked. So I'm taking up so many of your hours because the first time we talked, you had a, a giant storm in Alaska and I told you that it was uh, bucketing down here right. as well. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our second attempt at recording and I, I hope that um, all our listeners get to hear you and your extraordinary stories as I did the other day. And um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for asking me. I I am honored and privileged to be your first <laughs> podcast person. So You know, I've worked out that we are 9,000 miles from each other. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's because I'm close uh-huh. in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> but it feels like you're just sitting next to me I and know. uh yeah i have heard about you for a long time i first uh came to iptc in 2014 and i didn't meet you were you at that conference i don't remember i'm sure if i had met you i would remember it was a record winter i remember that i was living in indiana and uh you know, I just remember the minus numbers. I would look at them on my phone and think it was some sort of, you know, glitch that it was like minus what I would have it in centigrade, of course. And remember looking at my phone, it was like minus 32. And I'm like, there's going to be something wrong with, <laughs> no. with my phone. <laughs> the, you know, this is a minus before a number that I'm used to. There um, is yeah. a, a law in Canada that if it's centigrade, of course, if it's minus five, you cannot pass up a hitchhiker. You have to pick up anybody hitchhiking. And if it's minus 20, I think it might have been, you have to stop and help any motorist in trouble. I mean, there are literally signs on the side of the highway stating this, including one about 50 miles north of Whitehorse that says, basically, there is no coverage up here whatsoever. You are leaving the planet is what it feels like. You can't use your cell phone. You can't use a sat phone. You cannot connect to anybody. 
Wow, you're out of range. You're out of range. So there, there are no. these uh, progressions of what you can do and what you can't do. So, yeah, I understand the, uh, and I know centigrade because of driving in Yukon. And, yeah, well, it was, yeah, that was a big challenge for me. But I would have done anything to get to that conference because I, uh, you know, I really was desperate to learn more and I didn't expect to meet the extraordinary people on my journey. But I think I was saying to you earlier, I just kept knocking on doors until I met people that, you know, understood my frustration uh, with my journey in the field and um, progress that I was having with my own daughter and others that I was working with. But anyway, that's a long way of saying I'm so sad that I never met you earlier, but I have heard about your name for a long time and just feel so privileged to have you here today. Thank you. Now, one of the things that came up for me, actually, so many things came up for me when we talked earlier, but the two things that you really left me with that day uh, was your extraordinary laughter and the impact that just had on me. I heard your uh, laughter in my head all day. It's, oh. it's a, uh, <laughs> it, you can't help but laugh out loud when you hear you laugh. Thank uh, you. That was the first thing. And the second thing is just your bravery, the things that you have done in your life and the steps that you have taken and the way that you took that on. And I was going to, so the first question that I, I wanted to ask you so that you could share with your audience is the question that I asked you last week, which was, what do you think that it was in your genetics or, or your early life that caused you to take on big things and big challenges? Well, I have five ancestors who were directly involved in the American Revolution, and yeah. if they can be brave enough to make the weapons and the ammunition, if they can be brave enough to serve in the colonial army, if they can be brave enough to, one of them, write, help write the Constitution, be a vice president, be on the, the chief justice on the Supreme Court, then what's holding me back? I mean, why would I sit home and just say everything's fine and I don't need to do anything? But those people inspired me. And I was talking to one of my cousins a couple of months ago, and they inspired him also. And so that, and then on my father's side of the family, they were Canadians. Well, one of them actually came over on the Mayflower. So he was one of the first tens of people to arrive from England uh, in this country. And what gives you the courage to get on a boat where you're leaving? He left his family, his wife and children there to for them to join later and then to move to Canada. And then some of the other relatives in that family were sea captains. I mean, probably, I don't know, five or 10 of them were sea captains. What on earth gives you the courage to go out on the open ocean in a schooner and go uh, commercial fishing or do goods runs such as taking um, sugar and um, I can't remember the other things they took from Nova Scotia down to the West Indies. And uh, well, they bring back sugar and rum and I forget what they took down. But anyway, they, they did a they did a trade of things. And uh, yeah. I just, to me, I have a little thing on here that says a ship in port is safe. And it shows this little ship sitting there very quietly. And then it shows the waves in the next clip and yeah. uh, to move on to chaos, because that's exactly what it is. And so I've never been afraid of chaos because the American Revolution and going out to sea, they're both chaos. And yeah. uh, any war is chaos. I mean, organized chaos, you hope, but you come across those parts that aren't organized. So, You talked to me, too, about your uh, parents, but in particular about uh, how your father would never give you direct answers to questions that you would ask, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> leading questions, or how would you describe his parenting of you? Inductive. Yeah, in, in a word, inductive. Uh, my mother was very deductive, but my father was very inductive. So one of the English assignments when I was still in school was to interpret the Porter scene. And the teacher wasn't going to tell us what it was. So we went home and I'm reading it and I had no idea. I must have been 14. So 
I asked my father, who was a, a chemist, but also a Shakespeare authority, and to help me understand the Porter scene and a soliloquy. And he said, well, what does the first sentence mean? I mean, he didn't tell me what any of it meant, you know, and if I had trouble with that, it's like, well, what does the first clause mean? What does the second clause mean? And how would you put those together? And then what's the next sentence? And I, I, we probably spent two or three hours working on the Porter scene until I finally had a very good response due to his tutelage. And I happened to be the only student in the class the next day out of 25 of us who gave the accurate report on what the Porter scene was. But my father never told me. He just led me by asking inductive questions. Where do you think he developed um, those strategies from? His grandfather was um, John Burgess Cocken, who was a Canadian educator and who actually, uh, his, uh, the ideas he developed were about 25 or 40 years before Dewey, John Dewey, the American yeah, philosopher yeah. and educator. And so as I started reading my great-grandfather's ideas, I thought, well, that's what John Dewey said. So then I started checking dates. And my great-grandfather was older. Well, I don't know whether he was older or not, but he was uh, professionally ahead of, uh, in time of John Dewey. But at that time... Goodness, and how old would you have been when you started to read about him? Well, my great-grandfather, we had his books lying around the house, so I oh, probably really? started reading those when I was five or six years old, <laughs> even though I might not have understood them. And then John Dewey... Uh, Probably when I was at university, which would have made me, what well, was my senior year, so I would have been 21. Has it ever struck you what a rich childhood you had? It took a long time because one time my siblings are all older than I, and they were in their 50s and I was in my 40s. And we said, you know, we, we had a very different family from the people that we went to school with and the people in the neighborhood, and uh, whether it was grammar school or high school or college, you know, it was all at a much, a more profound level than most of the people that we knew. And of course, the, our classmates, you know, they were of the same, but, you know, some of them had deep and serious family problems, such as cancer and a mother dying or sch schizophrenia in the family or whatever the situation might be. Would you mind sharing your early schooling? Because it was pretty interesting, right, in terms of the type of school you went to. We were living... Well, I started school in Massachusetts. Yeah. And I went to kindergarten, a private kindergarten. And then I got sick half the year. And so uh, my kindergarten report, which I'm not exactly sure where it is, but my kindergarten report said that I was not ready for first grade. And uh, so I went to first grade and it, uh, the teacher kept me in at recess and asked me to read and I read. And so I finished off the morning and the rest of the year in the second grade classroom. So I only went to first grade for about an hour. And oh, really? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I was very sad to leave that room because my friends from the neighborhood that I walked to school with were in that class. And so she, acceler she accelerated you on the spot? She wanted me? Did you say she accelerated you? She pushed you? Yes, forward? on the spot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, wow. she, she contacted the principal, and the principal yeah. said, I don't know what the principal said, but something like, well, put her in second grade. And Jeepers. so I, I never went to first grade. Amazing. And <laughs> tell, us about, tell us about schooling from, from there. For me, I went to public school for four years, and it was noticeably different from going to private school. And what I ended up doing in public school was either tutoring the kids around me by subterfuge, because the teacher was a no-talk-in-the-classroom teacher, or when I was in fifth grade, she put me over on the side with all of the children who were special education, Long. This is in the 50s, long before there was any special education. Actually, it was in the 40s and 50s, late 40s and 50s. And so I would finish my work, and then I'd help Jeannie. I remember Jeannie, and I remember her name. And then there were other 
girls around me and boys. She made you a classroom assistant? <laughs> yeah, she made me a classroom assistant is what she did. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember noticing that nobody else was a classroom assistant. You know, I was, but what I was doing was I was doing, she'd give us all these math sheets and you could go yeah. back to the back of the room and get more. And I realized that I would time myself by looking at the clock and there were a hundred problems per page. And could I get them all done in, you know, two minutes? And then could I get them all done in one minute? And then I would go get another sheet and I'd do the another, another sheet. And I think at that point she thought, uh, or maybe before, you know, it's like uh, she doesn't need to do all these math sheets. She can, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll let her tutor these other kids. And she didn't object to my talking. And I had a wonderful time. So, I mean, these are skills that most teachers dream will show up in their students, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, then after that, we moved back to New York City and I went to private school again. And, uh, well, first of all, there wasn't anybody to tutor. And secondly, there was just fascinating material. Tell me about that school. There were 21 kids in the class, 21 students in the class. And I remember in sixth grade, we studied the history of Greece. We studied, it was a, an Episcopal school. And so we studied, well, we studied the Bible, which I just, I mean, it's fascinating literature. I love the yeah. stories in the Old Testament. And then the other thing that uh, we did, we studied Greek theater and Greek art. And so the sixth grade was all Greece, except we also read, well, we read the Iliad and the Odyssey. And not yeah. too many 11-year-olds read the Iliad and the Odyssey, but I, it was wonderful. And then we also read uh, a Shakespeare play. I can't remember which one. And so in grades six, seven, and eight, which would be 11, 12, and 13, we read a Shakespeare play. But in the middle of reading Hamlet, our eighth grade year, the old Vic announced Broadway that they were coming from London, that they were coming to New York City, and they weren't doing Hamlet, but they were doing Macbeth. So in the right. middle of reading Hamlet, she says, Oh, we got to stop reading Hamlet. We have to read Macbeth in three weeks, and then we're going to go. We're all going to go and see the play on Broadway. And then we yeah. did that, and we came back, and we finished Hamlet. And it's like, Goodness. how many people do that to a class of 13-year-olds? <laughs> <laughs> this teacher was one of the bravest teachers I've ever met in my life. I wow. mean, she just, uh, to have kids, you know, 11 years old read the Iliad and the Odyssey, and then yeah. read Hamlet and stop in the middle and read Macbeth and then come back and finish Hamlet, you know. And and, <laughs> and when I get together with them now, we're all absolutely amazed that we did that. <laughs> so you still see? Some oh, of yes, yes, people? absolutely. Oh, really? and, wow. and of the 21 students in that class, nine of them are either medical doctors or have a PhD, which is a... Yes. That's almost half percentage. the class, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it was wow. a fantastic school. And Goodness, that's wonderful. And yeah. So your decision to go into psychology and philosophy, do you think that was shaped by those experiences? It was shaped by two things. One was being so ill when I was five and having a near-death experience and then later decades later, finding out that I had ended up with epilepsy. And so when I was uh, now going, then after eighth grade, I went to a Quaker high school in New York City. And one of the things, being Quaker, that we were encouraged to do is to, to volunteer in the community in some way. And I don't know as everybody did that, but I took it very seriously. And I began to uh, volunteer at a nearby ho a hospital near to the school, about four or five blocks away. And they asked me, did I want to be, you know, somebody who sold things from the gift shop? And I thought, oh, that sounds deadly. So they also asked me, did I want to work with the elderly? And even though my grandparents had, or my grandmothers had lived with us, and we had lived in a hotel in New York City where there were a lot of elderly people, that just didn't appeal to me. 
and or did I want to work on a unit with children? And I thought, well, that sounds good. Well, as it turned out, that one was a unit for infants needing surgery, but it was also the unit of terminally ill children. I just wrote about them the other day for something, and uh, I remember their names. I can tell you what they looked like, you know, and what their personalities were, and they were, I loved it. And uh, I'm kind of surprised. Well, I know why I didn't go into medicine, but anyway. Well, you you skipped over something massive there that I want to come back to, and that is your early childhood experience. You you, uh, drop near-death experiences if it's, uh, you know, like you stubbed your toe. (laughs) (laughs) And and I'm glad you brought it up because I'm not sure I would have asked you that, but then your journey with epilepsy and only being diagnosed a couple of years ago and how that has had a profound impact on what you chose to study and uh, your observation of your own behaviour. So, But I want to put that on hold because now we're just uh, still in high school, right? And right. uh, you're making a decision about uh, later studies. We call it here university in Australia, but um, is that college? Is that, is that it's college, the next step out of high school? But where I applied, um, I applied to a college in this country, But I also applied, and my first choice was Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I wrote them a letter, and which I definitely still have. It's probably with that child, that kindergarten report card. And I said, (laughs) (laughs) you know, um, I'm very interested in coming to Dalhousie, and I I typed it. And you know, I've, I've spent four months in Canada in Nova Scotia. I don't know even know if I said that. And then I signed my name, Abigail Burgess Cawkin, which I don't usually do. And then right. I put P.S. My great-grandfather was John Burgess Cawkin. And so <laughs> I received a letter back in probably two or three weeks that said, Dear Miss Cawkin, we will be delighted to have you as a member of the student body next year. Application forms will follow in two to three weeks. And then what happened in the interim was that my father died and I thought I can't go to Nova Scotia and live with all my cock and relatives around me. I mean, I, I have no idea why I made that decision. It was a, it was a bad decision on my part, but you know, it's uh, my whole life would have been different. So I ended up um, going to the university of Colorado, which had not been in the original plan at all. And I hadn't even thought about that. Why did Colorado come up with you? Because my brother and his wife were moving to Colorado. And I think my right. mother thought it's not a good idea for her. All right, she's not going to go to Nova Scotia where there are a ton of relatives to look after. her. So I need to make sure that she goes somewhere where some family member can keep an eye on her. I mean, I'm 17 <laughs> right. years old, you know. and yeah. uh, So, and my father had just died. So she did not want to you know, send me off into some wilderness, so to speak. That's right. That's very young to go to college, yeah, by anyone's standard. And 17, 18 is normal in this country, yeah. Yeah, right. And so what what was your experience at the University of Colorado? (laughs) (laughs) Um, My first semester I was bored to tears because all the, the textbooks, all the material was the same as what I had covered in high school. So I was exempt from English. I was exempt from math, freshman English, freshman math, because of my scores on the um, college application tests. And so I was taking German, which took me, I'd never had any German, but it, I, I could cover the class material in about five or 10 minutes of study each day. I, I don't even remember the other courses I was taking specifically, but I think English history was one of them, which, you know, was a breeze for me because I grew up learning about English history and had a great interest in it. So anyway, I was, whatever I was taking, I was bored. Oh, I know. I was taking fourth year Latin or, and there were graduate students in there too. So it was a senior class, um, graduate class. Well, what were we reading? Virgil's Aeneid. I had just finished reading Virgil's Aeneid in Latin. Wow. So it was like, it was not difficult. And I just finished studying it. So anyway, 
I was sitting in the dorm room reading the university newspaper and yeah. I was so bored that I even read the ads. I never read the ads for anything. I was reading the ads and it said, uh, counselor wanted Wallace village M dash F three dash nine. And I interpreted that as three through nine o'clock Monday and Friday rather than Friday. Monday through Friday. So I called and uh, found out it was basically a full-time job. And uh, even though it was only 30 hours a week, which usually turned into 40. And I was her first applicant and turned out I was her only applicant because she gave me the job when I went to the interview. So I started work, I think, probably the next day. And, uh, and tell us about that way. This is, this is what... You oh, know, this was a right, school. This that, was a, right. This was a school for children with 1959, what they called minimal brain injury, which is now learning disabilities, and emotionally disturbed, which now is behavior disorders. But so I got the job and uh, I loved it. And so I and switched did from. Some of these, yeah. Did some of these kids have severe and challenging behavior? Oh, yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so you take on with 30 hours a week of working with these challenged kids. Right. And going to the University of Colorado full time. Yeah. As a 17, 18 year old. I was 18 by then. 18. Yeah. So Goodness. I've never had a job in my life. Three of the girls were older than I was, but they were the easy ones. And uh, some of the younger ones were very difficult to handle. And who were your teachers there? Who was? <laughs> they went to school during the day. So they had their yeah. lessons. And then I was the person to coordinate their activities after school between 3 and 9 p.m. So, and there was a cook. So the cook fixed supper for us. For us and then I determined what the... Monday through Friday afternoon activities were and what the Monday through Friday evening activities were. Who was helping you? Nobody, really. I mean, there was, wow. there was a fellow, because it was 15 miles from uh, the University of Colorado, and he had a car, and so we would drive to work together. But, you know, he didn't... What, I remember what he said was, Wednesday evenings, or maybe it was Thursday evenings... Thursday evenings, we listen to classical music because I can't do an activity every single day of the week <laughs> with these kids. He had a boys' yeah. cottage. I had a, a girls' and young boys' cottage. And so I do remember, it was either Wednesday or Thursday evening, We, he in his cottage and me in my cottage uh, would listen to classical music with the kids and talk to them about it ahead of time. And, and then Friday evenings were some ac out, outside activity, like taking them roller skating or to a movie or to a drive-in. There were still drive-ins in those days, something like that. Um, and then uh, Wednesday afternoon was horseback riding. I remember that. There were horses there. I knew nothing about and how it. Many, how many kids? Uh, I had 14. Wow. Ages five through, uh, there was a 19-year-old there. And, uh, and did you develop strategies? Uh, you know, and how do you get these kids to follow directions and leave on time? And was there? Oh, they didn't have any problem with time. They didn't have any problem. Everybody had the same bedtime, whether they were the older ones or the young ones. And the older ones didn't help the younger ones necessarily, you know. They, they did not turn into assistance for me. I was equally as responsible for them as I was for the five-year-old. I remember Monday evenings we wrote, I had them write letters home. Uh, that was Monday's activity. <laughs> I don't remember what the other activities were in the evenings or the afternoons, but, um, oh, one afternoon and maybe two afternoons a week, we played games. And I figured that helped yeah. social interaction and which they had difficulty with. Some of them were, about a third of them, two-thirds of them lived, uh, when they were at home, this was a boarding school, lived with their original biological parents. The other third 
were either adopted or came from a state home facility. We don't have many state homes these days, but uh, they, they had no parents or they had pretty much all of the kids either had no parents available or they had very dysfunctional parents available. Even those that were, came from very wealthy families, you know, it was just not good situation for them. How did that impact where you decided to go with your studies? Oh, I changed from being a Latin and Greek major into a psychology yeah. major. <laughs> <laughs> Was that directly as a result? Oh, of absolutely directly. It's like, I need, this is really interesting working with them. I need to know more in a formal studying way about children or, or about people. And so, about people in about general. About people so, in general. Uh, well, yeah, when did you make that change? My freshman year probably somewhere in the middle of second semester because I was still taking another Latin course of reading uh, Latin plays, plays by Latin playwrights in Latin. And uh, Plautus, Terence, and one more, and I can't remember his name offhand. But uh, basically, I spent the year reading Latin literature. And yeah. uh, so, and I loved it. I mean, I, I love literature. And now it doesn't matter whether it's French or Russian. You know, it's it's a little harder for me in the Russian, but I can I can still do it. So. Goodness, so we'll come back to that impact on your writing and, and how you took up writing. But um, tell us how you finished up in your psychology degree and, and what was your next sort of decision point from there? I finished all the psychology courses because I had to take them out of order because right. um, I was working so much. So I finished my psychology courses in my junior year and, and all the requirements. And then I was taking philosophy. And so I took my senior year at university. I took all philosophy courses except for two French pronunciation and articulation courses that were absolutely fabulous. And I'd had a lot of French by the time I got there. And so. Goodness, so do you still speak those languages? I used to. I wouldn't say I do anymore. My mother had lived in France, although yeah. she was born and raised in this country. And she had gone to graduate school at the Sorbonne in the 20s. So her French was excellent. And so yeah. I remember as a child, as a little child, you know, she would talk to me in French. And uh, so. And it was like, well, I guess I better understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love hearing, I love these early experiences because if you see how they've impacted your journey, right, your incredible journey. So you finish up at the University of Colorado. And, and I, what was your next I decision thought, point from there? What on earth am I going to do? I remember... My yeah. first year at the University of Edinburgh, which came after Colorado, writing in my journal, what am I going to do with my life? I mean, I like people. I get along with people. And so I'm going to go in for a job interview and say, I like people and get along with them. Please give me a job. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to work. <laughs> and so I went to the University of Edinburgh with the idea in mind of getting a master's degree in philosophy and teaching philosophy. Well, that's a big decision point. You go from uh, America to Scotland. Yes. Uh, what was your decision point there? I think I spent a lot of my li young life, I never have considered that I was bored, but it was like, oh, you know, this is boring. This is not challenging, maybe is a better word. And there was this notice <clears throat> on blue paper, um, British University Summer School. And you could go to Oxford, where I had lived as a teenager for a while, or you could go to London, where I had lived also, but I didn't want to move to a big city like that. And Or you could go to the University of Edinburgh. And so I applied to the British University Summer School, and the University of Edinburgh accepted me. And that was the original home, Edinburgh, of David Hume. And so that interested me. So I ended up moving to Edinburgh. And lived there for two years, and studied. So it was a ma a master's of what? Oh well, it was a master of letters, is what they called it. But I realized 
when I had about three or four months left, philosophy is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. And what am I doing in philosophy? I don't want to teach philosophy. So I left the University of Edinburgh and I moved to Oregon on a whim and uh, 7,000 miles away. (laughs) I got there and I knew one person whom I had dated in undergraduate school in Colorado, and that was it. So what I did, um, I didn't have a job. I, I, you know, I had a suitcase. <laughs> and uh, I got a job as a live-in housekeeper with someone who had a serious illness and was bedridden. But she could improve, and she did. And so that summer, they no longer needed me. That was when I uh, would go to the University of Oregon Student Union and just sit yeah. <laughs> like I need to meet people <laughs> and I didn't I didn't know how no, I mean, so yeah. I just went there and sat and people would come up and say when the union was full oh d- is anybody sitting here do you mind if I sit here and that's how I met people and so yeah. <laughs> it was like uh, it was kind of a silly thing to do and then I ended up um, getting a job they were setting up a new the Easter Seal Society which was for children with physical disabilities, was setting up a new program because the polio vaccine had been so effective. They had no more children with polio were coming in. So they established, the Easter Seal Society established a program for minimal brain injured children. That's what they called it. And so I went in for the interview. The employment office told me to go in for an interview and I went in for the interview And what they wanted was someone with a master's degree in speech and language and X number of years of experience in working with kids. And the head of the school had interviewed many candidates, maybe a half a dozen. And they all knew speech and language, but none of them had any idea what kind of children he was describing. I go in for the interview and... I knew exactly the kind of children he was describing and what program I would, you know, I mean, or how I would start the program. And I I walked into a room that was probably 40 by 60 feet. The walls were bright yellow. And I thought, I cannot live with these walls. And the only thing in the room was a pump organ where, you you know, you use your feet to pump the organ and you play. And I thought, okay, I can use that. We can do music with that. And I can teach the children music using a pump organ instead of a piano. And it had a stool. That was it. And uh, no teacher's desk, no chair, no children's desks or anything. And so the first week that I was there, might have been the first two weeks I was there, he handed me a bunch of catalogs and said, this is your budget limit and order what you need. Okay. (laughs) Did you want to to paint? (laughs) Oh, oh, that was the first thing I said to him. I said, these walls have to be painted and they need to be painted a very pale yellow. And he looked at me and he said, oh, you've been reading Crookshank. And I thought, I didn't do that. I thought, I wonder who Crookshank is. And uh, I smiled. (laughs) And he thought I meant yes. (laughs) I had no idea who Crookshank was. I had no idea who any of the people in the up-and-coming yet unnamed special education field were. But I just went on my past knowledge. These kids need organization. They need structure. They need... So I ordered... I remember I ordered pegboards. I ordered puzzles. I ordered um, balance boards. I don't know what I ordered for a reading program. But I started teaching them, you know, the letters. And about maybe a month later a graduate student working on his PhD at the University of Oregon came in and said, oh, would you like, I need you to use this program, this reading program. And he said, uh, it was Friday, and he said, uh, you could start on, you can read it over the weekend and start on Monday. Well, it was Gillingham, which happens to be a 9 by 12 book of 400 some pages. (laughs) And so I said, okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I took the book home, and my boyfriend and I had plans for the weekend. You know, we are going to go over to the coast or something like that. 
And I said, oh, I don't have any time this weekend. You know, I have to read this book and have a lesson plan for Monday morning and all the, all the week. So he said, okay. And he came by and checked on me at some point. And so I started teaching the program on Monday. Very analytical, very phonic-based, wonderful program. And Remind us what year this is, Abigail? What year is this? 1965. It's the, right. fall, the beginning of the school year in 1965. And so he, this fellow comes back, three, the university graduate student, comes back three weeks later and says, oh, by the way, have you read the Gillingham book that I gave you to read? And I said, well, you told me to read it over, the, and when can you start? And he told, I said, you told me to read it over the weekend and start on Monday. So that's what I did. <laughs> We've been doing it for three weeks, and it's wonderful. <laughs> And I had wow. a teacher assistant who was probably as, well, she was, she was as naive as I was, looking to me for direction. And in those days, we were responsible for cleaning our own room, you know, the classroom. Yeah. So we cleaned the classroom, which also meant we cleaned the two bathrooms that we had, because there was nobody right. in the building who did that. The teacher was responsible for all of this. So it was, it was very interesting. And those kids were challenging but in a totally different way i mean you know a, a boy who reads backwards or who doesn't he's seven years old doesn't know the letters of the alphabet because he keeps getting them all mixed up either by reading them backwards or mistaking one letter for another letter and and uh, the parents were bless their hearts they were absolutely desperate because these children were flunking whatever grade they were in, including a little boy in kindergarten. Stephen was in kindergarten, and he was flunking kindergarten. And How would you have described those kids back then? Um, well-behaved. Yeah. They were very well-behaved. They were eager to learn. And the term learning disabilities didn't come around. The uh, Association for Children with Learning Disabilities did not come into being until a couple of years later. And so, but it was came from concerned parents who were saying, like concerned parents of autism, children with autism now, my child has special needs and he's not work. it's not working in the, then the regular classroom. And then I realized these kids who were sitting next to me in fifth grade, they all had learning disabilities or a couple of them had, uh, you know, were very slow learners. And I thought, well, I know what I did with them then. I guess I'll start there. And so that's, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I was so naive. <laughs> so I taught there for two years, and then I took a year's leave of absence and went to the University of Oregon and started my master's degree under Barbara Bateman, who was a, a top person in learning disabilities at the time in special ed. And then I went back and was the program director for what was now two classrooms, so it was uh, it was great. And I remember one of the country school districts had a junior, I think she was in high school, who needed a job placement of some sort because academically she was not cutting it at all. Right. And she, she also refused to talk. So they gave her to me. <laughs> I, <laughs> Oh my gosh. And so I just thought, you know, it's, it's, I did a lot of on the job training. I, that's how I started climbing mountains in Oregon was OJT on the job training. I never took any course in climbing a mountain, but I have climbed four mountains in Oregon and one of them twice. And, and well, one was in Washington, but anyway, you know, you just go and you do it and just do it. Just do it. And so this so, girl refused to so talk. So you, you were the Nike girl long before uh, Nike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Nike it. did not exist in Beaverton, Oregon at that point. <laughs> yeah. But the U of O track team definitely existed, um, <laughs> which I believe was Bob Bowerman was one of the coaches. Anyway, this girl, you know, I would ask her a question. And rather than giving her an answer, if she didn't answer me right away, I would just wait. And I would say, it's okay. Yeah. I'm just going to wait until you think of something and say it. And so by the time she left, about a year and a half later, she was 
she was talking. She was a regular assistant. She was wonderful, you know, and, and could you do this? Yes, I'll do that. And she'd do it. And, but I mean, it just, just like I was doing with the kids, you know, and look as in the precision teaching little steps for little feet. And she had really little feet because she didn't know how to communicate with people. I have no idea what her home life was like. I know her school life was pretty miserable. And uh, so had anybody labeled her with any there forms? weren't there weren't labels then there weren't labels the then. labels were just coming about you know special yeah. ed was just coming into being a field yeah no she had no label yeah so you just thought that anything was possible for her yeah I think I did I just assumed you know well with a little coaching she can do this so. So, so far we're an hour into our conversation and we haven't mentioned uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> precision teaching or behavior analysis. Right. So something, and yet you were exposed to all of these areas where behavior analysis has had a major impact. Absolutely. Right. So at what point did this occur for you? I think you said you came to behavior analysis through the back door. Right. Eric Houghton came to the University of Oregon in the fall for fall quarter. Uh, Oregon's on a quarter system and came yeah. to the University of Oregon for fall quarter to teach his first class. And it was called precision teaching. Nobody in the department had a clue what he was doing because he hadn't finished his dissertation for a 10 week course. He was six weeks late. And <laughs> so. <laughs> But my advisor, Barbara Bateman, had said, we have this guy coming from Kansas and he's teaching something called precision teaching and we don't know what it is. And I want you to take it and I want you to tell me if it's worth recommending to the other graduate students. And she actually said, I want you to be a guinea pig. And I'm like, fine, I'll be a guinea pig, Barbara. You know, I mean, what I was learning from her was fantastic. And yeah. so the first six weeks we saw films of... Uh, Ellie Reese, who was working at Mount Holyoke uh, with Dogs and Horses, I believe, and uh, Ivar Lovas, and Skinner and Pigeons, which I'd already had at undergraduate school. First time I ever had respect for pigeons was listening. B.F. Skinner came to the University of Colorado and gave a lecture, and a um, uh, psych honors seminar. And I just thought, you know, I grew up in New York City, and I once went to school, I'm having just washed my hair and kerplunk, lo and behold, I had to go into the girls' washroom and wash my hair again because a pigeon had just shat on me. <laughs> and, and so, so, uh, I didn't care for pigeons your... <laughs> and, until B.F. Skinner came to talk to us about pigeons. And it's like, I owe these birds some respect. <laughs> So when Eric came, oh, and then we, you know, saw some films on Skinner. And that's because the department head had no idea what, nobody had any idea what Eric was going to teach. And so he taught it. And in, for four weeks, we took the course and I made the mistake of doing time over time, which when we very first started using the chart, we had no idea about well, if Og had an idea about duration, I certainly didn't know what it was. And I didn't know Og at that point either. But um, now we can measure duration. We did not have any symbols or any concept of measuring duration, which is what I should have been measuring for my project. So I got an incomplete in the course, which was actually a gift because the following semester, I started working with a slow student and yeah. I did a, a great project, but we still didn't have the one minute timing yet. So I was teaching and timing Richard for 20 minutes. And right. I can't remember the exact date that that winter term course ended. It was either the 22nd or the 28th. I think, I think it was the 28th of March. And then yeah. it was in, it was April 4th when Ann Starlin did the first one minute timing in her classroom, which was an idea of Eric Houghton and Harold Kunzelman, who was in Seattle. 
They came up yeah. with this idea and they both credited the other person for coming up with it. And so Anne was the first teacher to do a one minute timing. So I know exactly when we switched from uh, 20 minutes timing to, or 10 minutes or an hour to a one minute timing, which has been an absolute All right, challenge. so let me stop you there because uh, what I'm thinking about right now is our listening audience are going to be, uh, currently my podcast uh, is listened to by behavior analysts, precision teachers. There are also speech and language pathologists and occupational therapists. So just to uh, bring them up to speed, that 20-minute timing that you would have taken, what would you have been teaching in that 20 minutes? Ah, uh, for your speech and language people. Oh, gosh, Richard. Richard, in talking, did not use any verbs whatsoever. All his sentences right. were nouns and uh, a pronoun or uh, I don't know whether he used adjectives or not, but he, he there were no verbs. So my job, I decided, was to teach him to use verbs because then his speech would be more fluent and people would be yeah. more willing to listen to him. So he would say, my hat bed. And it's like, mm -hmm. my hat is on the bed. So I would have him... I would say, my hat is on the bed. And I would make him say that. And it might have been, I don't, I don't have the chart in front of me, so I don't remember how many errors he made, but I know he had some. And, I, and whenever he said the sentence correctly, I um, yeah. had, had this little supply of paper clips. Uh -huh. and, and Richard received a paper clip. I don't know of what value a paperclip was, but he was willing to work hard to get correct answers so he could earn these paperclips that I was offering. I don't know as they earned any reward afterwards. That was up to the family who had him as a foster child. So all he got from me was verbal praise and paperclips. And, Did he collect them? Oh, yeah, he saved them because I think the family had it so that X number of paperclips can get you this. And nice. so, yeah, yeah. So that was, that was my successful project. Well, that 20 minute lesson would have been training some examples of the use of verbs in sentences and having right. him say them, repeat them back to you. And you would have been recording correct repeat of the sentence. Correct, the correct, co correct use of verbs and incorrect use. And the incorrect use was incorrect use as well as no verbs in the sentence at all. So, and the chart that you had to chart on, does that look like the chart of today? Yes, it was the DC-8, the daily chart right. 8. And if I right. thought about it, I would have um, pulled it out of my file cabinet. It's right over there. <laughs> I have it on a transparency <laughs> right now. And, well, and it's an well, I'm going to share some uh, resources with uh, our listeners uh, after this. So I might ask you to send me some of those things that people would really like to see. Oh, okay, okay. It it's on an overhead transparency that's over oh, wow. that's over the years gotten a little brown on the edges. And then Anne's chart is published in the Teaching Exceptional Children spring issue of nineteen seventy one in an article that her then husband Clay Starlin wrote. And I asked them, uh, Teaching Exceptional Children, uh, if I could use that chart in an article. And I was told, yes, if you pay me $700, if you pay us, the organization, $700. And I thought, I think I'll figure a way around that because I, I was not about to. I didn't have $700 to pay them. Yeah. And uh, so I didn't pay them. Goodness, anymore. does it strike you that for someone like myself who accidentally found their way to precision teaching, but the experience that you had there, to someone like myself, feels like the most extraordinary coincidence that these people came together at this time and you came in contact with an incredible tool as a teacher. At the time, were you aware of, you know, what was occurring, that there was, this was kind of groundbreaking change in education and that it might impact, you know, the rest of your life? Or was it just a, something that was occurring as part of your study and... No, it was more than that. And I knew it would yeah. impact me because I remember when I was when Eric finally showed up and I was taking instruction from him 
and he showed us the chart. And my father was a, had gotten a bachelor's degree from MIT in mathematics, and then he went on to get a master's degree in chemistry. And so I was very aware of the value of the sciences. I mean, I, my sister was a chemist, my brother was a geologist, and my mother was a linguist who was absolutely particular. If you made a grammatical error at the dinner table, she would correct you. <laughs> And if yeah. she was in company, she had the ability to raise one eyebrow. And so, you know, if we were at a, a social event and I made a grammatical error, she would raise one eyebrow. So it was like, yeah, there was this constant instruction going on. And so when I saw the chart, I thought, this is the most powerful thing for measuring I don't know whether I was thinking learning or human behavior or what, but this is incredibly powerful. And because up up until that point, right, you had worked with a lot of kids, right, taught them a lot of things. Mm -hmm. What had you used up until that point to assess the effectiveness of I had what not. you were teaching? I had not. I yeah. had not. And it was when I came. You know, I we worked the first two years. I worked the first year, and then there was another teacher who joined me the second year, and then I went back to graduate school, and then I brought the chart back when I came back in 19, the fall of 1968, and then Louise and I both started using it, and then there was another teacher there, and she started using it. I mean, I didn't give them an option. You know, it's like, okay, you need to use yeah, this chart use every this. day, you need to, and they each had a teacher, teacher assistant. So it was very possible. And I mean, there were powerful things that happened. Like I remember Velda, one of the teachers, said, Daniel talks all day long. I can't get anything done. <laughs> and I said, okay, Velda, count how many times he talks and in a, in a day, in a school day. And she counted and she came to me at the end of the first day and said, four, but he's so loud that he takes over the entire classroom. And so, you know, it was like, okay, we've got a different problem on our hands. I mean, she knew it immediately. She knew it before yeah. she came to me at the end of the day that this is not a numbers problem. This is a volume problem okay. that, because his voice was so loud. And I don't remember at all how, I'm not even sure I had to give her any advice. I mean, I think she may have said, okay, I need to tell him to talk more quietly. So can you just um, talk a lot there, Abigail, how attending to a chart impacts what you're going to teach? Oh, yeah, yeah. And my example for that was Charles at the same, at the right. Children's Hospital School. And in the very first year of my teaching, Charles, oh, God, what a handful. He ran, he ran away from me. He ran across the room. This is this 40 by 60 foot room. And I put, I started chasing him. And then I thought, so I put my hands on my hips and I said, Charles, I am not going to get in a power struggle with you. Charles stopped, turned around and looked at me and said, you already are. <laughs> <laughs> He's absolutely right. So I turned around and walked away and he went back to his desk and sat down and started working. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I can't believe this kid just one upped me. And I mean, at, at that point, what am I going to do? Argue with him? No, I'm not going to continue the power struggle. And then another thing I learned from him was that when I, this was the following year, when I gave him verbal praise, his inappropriate, loud classroom behavior jacked up. And right. one day, by happenstance, I walked by him and I patted him on the shoulder and I never said a word. And he turned and looked at me and smiled and went back and got right back to work. And I thought, ah, wow. don't say a word, Abigail, give him a thumbs up, give him a pat on the shoulder, give him a pat on the back. This kid does not need verbal rewards. He needs physical rewards. And so then at that point, I, or maybe before, but we also had, well, they weren't post-it notes, but we also had something, and I would just put a ticket on his desk. 
that meant you're doing a good job. And then at the end of each class, we'd count up the tickets and he'd write it on his little card. And I mean, every child had that, not just Charles. And uh, so this, before, this is before you're exposed to the core principles of behavior, though. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. These were strategies that you found were right, right, right. I mean, it's and then another time, uh, I remember looking at him, and this was re- this really interests me now. I remember I was teaching him. And he wasn't there. He was looking at me. And I actually, I literally went like that. You know, like, uh, (laughs) yeah, right, you know, less than a foot from his face. No response whatsoever. And I thought, this kid is having a, well, then they called them petty mal seizures. Now they call them absence seizures. So he was having an absence seizure. So end of the school day or actually maybe the next you know recess they had i called his mother up and i said you need to take him to a doctor he's having some sorts of seizures well no wonder he wasn't doing well in school because he was missing out on instructions and he'd get part of them and those are usually you know 30 seconds to a minute 20 seconds to a minute they don't last long but and then i became aware of when they were happening and so I would stop talk. I would stop teaching him, and I would just wait until he was back. And then he, you know, sort of move his head and look at me. And then it was I could continue with the instruction rather than keeping on going and expecting Charles to remember what had been said in the meantime, which he didn't even hear. And so it turned out maybe because of your own early experiences that you were a very good observer of behavior. I have no idea. I mean, because I didn't even know about that part of me at that point. And so I didn't, that was 1966, 67. And I didn't find out about me until 2019. So I just. You shared shared with me that you became very aware of your own behavior because of things that were occurring for you Mm -hmm. that were different to what other people were experiencing. Right. And. And those were not absence seizures because when you have one, you don't know it's happening. So even though they were, and I've had other people tell me in the past, oh, what is this, 2021. So since I've had somebody tell me within the past five years, you know, you just had one. And uh, right, they have observed it or this person knew we were working on a project together for the military and he knew that he had given me this one particular instruction. He was in charge of the project. And I said, no, you didn't. So after this, no, you didn't tell me. Yes, I did. I thought, you know what? If he's this sure, he's probably right. And of course, now that I, once I learned about my own epilepsy, it's like, well, of course he was right. You know, only I just, I was on the phone. I was sitting right where I am now. And I didn't hear him at all. Are we going to come back to that? Because I think that's a fascinating story, which you're probably going to uh, tell in varying ways in your life um, of how you had a near-death experience as a child and you became very aware of your own inner behaviour and how that later impacted your Mm -hmm. uh, PhD, et cetera. Absolutely. But right now we're back at you being, as a teacher, teacher. starting to chart data. Right, right. Oh, it was Wonderful. And seeing the effectiveness of your own strategy and being able to make decisions on the spot of what to teach next or what to do next. Right. And uh, trying to think. And moving else. from 20 minute timings is what you said to being. To a one minute to timing. Instructing across one minute. And, and why is it that one minute is an important amount of time to take data? <laughs> you <know, laughs> you're laughing. <laughs> that is a really interesting question because I said to Og one time, we were sitting in his office at the University of Kansas, and I said, what is it that occurs within the brain that makes the one-minute timing so effective at teaching something? And he said, as Og, I don't care about what's going on in the brain that makes it. All I care about is what I'm seeing on the charts, and, and that's what to look at. And I thought, Okay, but I'm still interested in what is it that's going on in the brain that makes the one-minute timing so effective, or 30 seconds, or, you know, whatever. And Whatever the amount of time is. Yeah, I, I haven't figured that out. 
But uh, we do know, without knowing why, we do know that it's effective. Yeah. And so, and and I love doing it when I um, am in a period where I'm studying more French or studying, or when I was learning Russian. I mean, I, I taught myself, I knew I was going to, to the Soviet Union, and I taught myself Russian in one semester, no college instruction whatsoever. Um, I went and bought a book, or several. I bought flashcards, Russian flashcards, and I made them, and I did a one-minute timing, and in one semester, all on my own, because I knew I was going in December, and actually, I think I may have covered an entire year in that one semester, just by doing timings on, um, see, say, Russian to English, English to Russian, and, oh, and then reading them, just reading the Russian words. And and what I did was I timed myself on in, in English. How fast could I do it in English? Well, it's how fast you can turn the cards, which for me was 95 to 110. So, and I could wow. do them with English that fast. So, therefore, my goal for that was in Russian, 95 to 110 per minute. And then the translation, whether Russian to English or English to Russian, took a little bit longer. But And then I would time myself on uh, reading you know, just reading passages. And in using uh, recordings, what then was the best one was Pimsler, and it was an audio on a cassette tape. And yeah. um, I found that I was speaking 35 to 50 Russian words per minute. And I right. thought... So you would go back and count them? So you would record it and have to go back and count each word? No, I could I could use a clicker counter as I was. Oh, you, cl- yeah. you had clickers. And okay. uh, so <laughs> I thought. As, so, you, as you read or as you listened? As I spoke, as I responded to the questions, you know, I could count yeah, each right. word that I said. And, yeah. you know, if he asked, for, you know, describe a, a horse running down the field. You know, I would count the words or, you know, actually his uh, directions were more specific than that. And I was, I could say, I got from 35 to 50 words a minute. And I said, there is no sane Russian who's going to listen to me talk Russian at that speed. I mean, are you going to listen to somebody? Too slow. (laughs) Yeah, too slow. I mean, how many of us listen to uh, a normal adult speaking English at 35 to 50 words a minute? What do you think is a normal rate of speak? Of uh, speaking? Clay Starlin says 150 to 200, but he's also a slower talker than I am. So for me, it's definitely over uh, 200. It's over 250 a minute. And then there was an Alaska weatherman named Reuben B. Eaton III. And unfortunately, yeah. the man died in his early 50s. But this man could give the weather report for land ocean and air, temperature and freezing levels for the entire state of Alaska in (laughs) half an hour. And he spoke, I I did time his words, he spoke at 400 words a minute. But with the visuals, it was so easy to understand what was happening. You know, uh, rime ice at 10,000 feet in the interior, uh, rime ice at 20,000 feet, is, you know, anyway, on like this. And I'm, I, we had just moved to Alaska and I'm thinking, what's rhyme ice? And uh, so it was <laughs> pretty, pretty incredible. You make a very interesting point there that nobody would have wanted to listen yeah. to you speak Russian at 50 words per minute. Right. It's uh, one of the things that often comes up for me is, you know, many times people in the education field, when talking to children that are not responding to their instructions, will slow down their instruction. Is that right? Is that fair to say? <laughs> right, they do. Or when somebody is deaf, they talk louder. Or somebody is blind, they talk louder. And it's like, no, sorry, this is not the right approach. You know, it's, um, um, I have a sister-in-law or a cousin-in-law, I guess I should say, who died just a couple of days ago, who was, we were friends in childhood and all the way through until a couple of days ago. And uh, she's blind. And so, but did I talk louder when I talked to Peg? No. You know, there's nothing wrong with Peg's hearing. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, you know, you, she couldn't uh, see. you know, she just couldn't see. That's all. So here you are um, being exposed to precision teaching. 
what was your next decision point in terms of how to take that into your career and what your next step was? I left the Children's Hospital School, oh, I know, in June of 1970 because I was pregnant. And there were two other teachers who were pregnant and were not hired for the 70-71 school year. That was what was happening socially in the culture in those days. And there was a teacher in another school in Eugene, special ed school in Eugene, who sued the school. She was going to be there in September and in May. And they fired her and she sued the school and got hired back for the following year. And I I remember at the time thinking, I think I would rather spend my time. I mean, I admire her and I understand her point. I would rather spend my time with my child than with a lawsuit. And so I decided I wasn't going to do that. So all of a sudden I was out of a job and I got a call from (laughs) the fellow who had helped me with learning how or giving me materials who was working oh, on his the dis- reading program uh, yeah right the reading program and right. and uh the little reward program that we had token economy and uh he said hey there's a job here at the university of oregon and uh, are you interested and i said sure i mean it paid a lot more than what i was making and so i worked at the university of oregon in 70 to 72 At the same time, I was teaching part-time at, it was called Oregon College of Education then, now it's Western Oregon University, and that was 80 miles away, so I was traveling and teaching there in the summertime, and then I really liked that, so in 1972, I stopped, uh, well, and the program was done. It was a federal grant, and the grant was done, and I had literally put together an entire bibliography of all professional articles and materials that were for multi-handicapped students, preschoolers, and which included infants and anybody up to about age three, maybe four, and uh, all kinds of disabilities. And I put all this together and the grant ended. And so then I got a a job teaching at uh, Western Oregon University. And uh, taught there for three that, years. Did that bibliography become anything? Uh, it did at the time, but you know now it's out of date. And nobody, yeah. I mean, very few people do a bibliography because that means all of the research. So what we usually have are references. And of course, as far as multi-handicapped or multi- multiple D- 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 D, we now have, I mean, it has expanded greatly since then and uh developmental disabilities so you know but it was it was good and i met some absolutely wonderful parents and wrote a toilet training program and a spoon feeding program and the toilet training program was eventually published by mcgraw hill and i didn't get any money for it because i'd already been paid uh on the grant so the money probably went to the federal government i guess and then the spoon feeding program. And I had others in mind that I was going to do. Was there precision teaching built into that? Yes, program? yes, yes, there oh, was. Wow. Oh, and then at the uh, when I came out with the toilet training program, uh, Fox and Asman came out with their toilet training program, which, you know, blew mine out of the water. So, I mean, they, they were already in the field. You know, I, I had a master's degree as well. <laughs> and yeah. so... Um, and that, that didn't bother me at all. It's like, you know, you have to respect when somebody has more knowledge than what you have. So I taught, and when I taught at Western Oregon, everybody in the class had to do a one-minute academic timing in, well, I taught reading courses and math courses, and they had to do it in the subject area with at least one student. They had to learn something new themselves, be it the guitar or a foreign language or whatever, do the one minute timing, corrects and errors on both. And then they had to do a behavior project on a student. And then they had to do an inner behavior project. And so they had, each person had at least four sets of charts. And then my best friend, Diana Dean, who was a nurse, had her doctorate from the University of Oregon and uh, was the director of, set up the program and then was the director of 
the first nursing program at Mount Hood Community College in Portland, died. She was in her mid-30s. And um, I was devastated, and as were many people, including her two sons who were 15 and 13. So I called Og up because I didn't know, obviously I knew him by this time, I didn't, and I'd taken two short courses in Kansas City from him, and I didn't know whether he knew. And um, he, as it turned out, he did know. And he said, what are you doing these days? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm teaching at Western Oregon, and I thought about getting a PhD, and I was about comma, but I decided <laughs> against it. Well, he interrupted me before the comma. <laughs> And he said, come to Kansas, study with me. And I, I was like, wow. I said, I'll tell you what, my husband and I are coming up for, he's coming up with our son and we're going to Diana's memorial service in Portland this weekend. Let me, and I'd already been in, I was the keynote speaker for the Washington State CEC, Council for Exceptional Children, that same weekend. There was no way I could have given, you know, a five-minute talk, let alone a keynote oh. address. And so we went to Diana's funeral, and uh, I told Og, let me think about it for two or three weeks and talk to my husband. When my husband got there, I told him <clears throat> about Og's invitation, and uh, he said, well, if that's what you want to do, that's fine with me, which would require us moving from Oregon to Kansas, which is 2,000 miles. Wow. And giving up our lifestyle, our full-time jobs, you know, everything. He said, I suppose I could go to college. I've never gone to undergraduate school. And so we moved to Kansas and uh, lived in married student housing. Well, oh, the long and the short of it is I talked to him on Friday, and I called him back on Monday and wow. said, I'm in. I think I'll do it. <laughs> So now, even even before that, though, you mentioned that you had your students measure inner behavior, right? So, right. how did you first get interested? Because some of the people that are listening to this podcast will think that as behavioralists, we don't care about what goes on beneath the skin. But going back even then, you had started to think about inner behavior before talking to Og and in, his, in <laughs> verbal and, behavior and in yeah. science and the human. And science and human behavior, Skinner talks about inner behavior. Did I say yeah. science and inner behavior? I meant science and human behavior. And I happen to have these out because I was talking to somebody else yesterday about <laughs> well, that's it. Probably a, that's probably a book you need to write. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Skinner did a really good job of giving us the foundation, the philosophical, even the behavioral foundation for doing this. What he didn't do was to take the research that he had done for the behavior of organisms and for uh, the book that he and Furster wrote together, Schedules of Reinforcement. He stopped doing research after that. So he never researched inner behavior. And I, I have somewhere in Science and Human Behavior, I have a comment on a page. Yeah. Oh, Skinner, go one step further. Why did you wait for Ogden to do this? Well, he didn't wait for Ogden to do it, but he just, you know, the way ideas develop, they don't develop rapidly. You can't do a one minute timing and teach a kid the way you can do it and teach a kid to read two years in one year using a one minute timing a day. It doesn't work for thinking. It doesn't work for thought development. I mean, if you look at the history of, of philosophy. You know, it takes a long time for people to, for ideas, for people to develop ideas. And so I, I give Skinner that, that it, it does take a while to develop yeah. ideas. But he planted the seed for the work that you later took on. So when did you first read Verbal Behaviour? And I first read that's <laughs> I am ashamed to say, I first read Science and Human Behavior, let me look at my signature, oh, somewhere when I was in graduate school, probably with Og, and yeah. I first read Verbal Behavior, 
probably within the last four or five years after moving here to Alaska. And it's like, I, I remember somebody saying, you will never be able to read verbal behavior without a group of people to discuss the ideas with. It's like, these are things I picked up along the way. So when I pick up verbal behavior, it's like, it, to me, it's an extension of science and human behavior, which is an extension of what Og did when he first started looking at inner behavior. And then I started looking at it in, I did a, uh, I didn't chart this, but I started looking at it in 1969 when my first husband and I were having problems. And I thought, well, not when we were first having problems, but while having problems. And, and I thought, this man is so negative. I am going to count uh -huh. the number of times he says, gives me a compliment and the number of times he says something negative. Kind of like Daniel in the classroom. In yeah. a 45 or a half hour drive, he gave me 20 compliments and no negatives whatsoever. Wow. And I thought, okay, Abigail, you are hearing negatives that have nothing to do with it because he's giving you compliments. Wow. And that was when it was like, that was in April of 1969. And I thought, that's it. You know, I've got to learn more about this. And and it was just a casual count. You know, I was probably counting on my, well, I did have, I did have uh, my bead counter. You had your bead counter because why did you have your bead counter back then? To count behaviors and behaviors on myself and on children. And I probably had it on or it was on my desk on that drive when he drove me home and when was my first inner behavior project? Goodness, I don't remember. I, I don't know. I have to look that up. <laughs> but it, it, <laughs> surely it was early. Um, now, but what you held up just then, which our listeners can see, obviously, I would love to get a photo of what you just held up then. How did you come to design that? Um, is Og had one and Eric had right. one. What do you call it? It's a wrist counter. It's a bead counter. I call it a bead counter. And when I first made my first one, I had six rows on each side. And it's basically an abacus. And okay. uh, so it, it functions like an abacus. Now I have four rows on one side and five rows on the other side. And that's fine. Do you, still, do you still use that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Because when that's, I first started to... Uh, when I first started to read your work, I started to measure positive and negative statements. Uh, and I had a blue clicker and a red clicker. But these things are, you know, I work with kids with special needs. So, you know, you have a lot going on a lot of the time. So it's very hard to reach for a clicker somewhere while, you know, keeping your eye on kids. Exactly. So, uh, right. And has anyone ever made these to sell? Or um, now Clay like Starlin them? knows someone who has made them to sell. And whether the person is still doing that or not, I don't know. I do know that I started wearing this in the 60s and the 70s. That was fine. Once I got into public school work, and of course, nobody in the graduate school when I was uh, getting my PhD under Og, nobody questioned it because, you know, they knew Og and either they liked him or they thought he was crazy and, you know, oh, you've got a counter like Og does. What do you do with that thing anyway? And, or, you know, some comments like that. And then in the 80s, uh, people would say, that's an ugly, clunky watch band. Why do you have that? <laughs> so then I move up to Alaska. It wasn't in the 80s. It was in the late 90s. And because there's such a strong Native culture here in Alaska, Native American culture, I will have people in the grocery store stop me or walking down the street and stop me and saying, oh, that's beautiful watch band. Uh, where did you get it? Well, I made it. Well, what'd you make it out of? Well, this happens to be smoked moose hide and <laughs> pipe cleaners and beads you know, and a watch I bought at a store. Well, now I've got a Fitbit, so I wear the Fitbit, but I, I do have this with me. Prophet, do you prefer to count on that? I do. The, uh, the Fitbit counts, uh, you know, physical activity and things like that. Yeah. This is where I count the behaviors. And I'm having trouble getting back into 
counting writing thoughts because they often come when I'm interacting with people. And while I used to be able to do that in um, the 80s, uh, 81, 80, 80, 81, 81, 82, in, the, in that, the very early 80s, I think I got into that gradually. And now I'm acting as if I can jump right back into where I was. Well, it's not quite that way. And so, you know, it's taking me a while. So my data is very bouncy and um, that's okay. I'm going to keep it. I know it's not, uh, the counts aren't valid because I'm missing way too many, but at some point the chart will level out and it'll, it'll have a whole lot less bounce. So that I have a million and one questions right now. <laughs> but one being, uh, something that you shared with me because I, when I started to track my positive and negative statements, I was like, Oh no, I've not started or I've missed an hour today and now it's too late. But you shared with me, it's not, it's not too late. You can too still, late. you can still check your time. You can start to count and just take the interval of time and, and chat what you can. Right. I um, had to do that myself this week, yesterday. In yeah. fact, I think it was, maybe it was Sunday. No, it was yesterday because I talked to John Eshelman and Kent Corso and I got so involved in the conversation because I was talking to the, well, about different things, but I was talking to John about the presentation that I'm going to do at the Standard Acceleration Conference uh, coming up in November in Florida. And so I got so involved in the ideas and writing down and taking notes and everything, I forgot. I was like, oh, no, I talked to John and then I talked to Kent for, you know, a total of three hours and I completely forgot to count ideas in those three hours. So I simply took three hours, you know, my record floor minus three hours, which upped it a little bit, and put down the counts that I had. And the creative ideas, definitely, I could remember because I wrote them down. And that was when that one of those was, I'm an hour away from tomorrow. John said, <laughs> <laughs> when I said that, John said, that will make a great title for a poem. So I wrote it down on one of my little three by five cards and uh, it will turn into a poem. I'll have to do some. I love that. Yeah, I do too. I do too. It's fun. So I'll have to do a little mathematical so, calculation. But I'm going to stop and summarize here because we're only a, a small part into what I wanted to share with the audience of your extraordinary journey and your journey through behavior analysis and precision teaching. And then this amazing world of inner behavior that with my, just my tiny little exposure to it, I feel like the interventions that can change the world. Mm -hmm. And because we have a world that is full of people that are going through a lot of challenges, oh, difficult, circ difficult circumstances. Yes, yes. And there are some very general ideas out there in the world of what we can do to uh, impact our own behavior and mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of people in the world going, uh, you know, just stay hard. <laughs> you know, get better. Be strong. Yeah, right. You know, just, just do it. But, I mean, you have some pretty profound interventions that people can use on their own behavior mm -hmm. to impact the way they right. interact with the world every day. And just in the short amount of time, I've started to – to track my positive and negative statements, it has had a dramatic impact on the way I talk about myself and others, and I'm sharing it with my team, and it's something that I really want to do more work with you on to share this extraordinary thing that you have brought to the world, and I, I feel there's a, a huge amount on offer to how it can impact you. But, you know, I was just amazed at how many complaints I make to myself before 8 o'clock in the morning. Are you, you charting know? it? Are you charting it, Mandy? Yes, I am okay, charting good, it. Okay, good, good, yes, good. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so even even on that, because I, uh, you know, I use now we don't use paper charts at Fit Learning. We uh, we have a system for using PDF charts. But through this process, I also found my way to Aimstar, and there is another conversation with you oh, about okay. how you came to that. But I I want to honour before we just finish up here because I. I am going to beg of you that you come back and do a second episode with me on inner behavior and your journey to OG and your PhD and how that came up for you and your extraordinary story of a near-death experience and how that impacted your ability to observe your own behavior, differences in your own uh, sub-local talk to yourself and how other people 
and how this impacted your journey into this extraordinary intervention that you've developed. Uh, and and we haven't even mentioned your writing. Um, <laughs> so, but I have a session to go to. <laughs> you have well, other <laughs> work to do. <laughs> I have a, a little boy with autism that's going to be waiting for me in 15 minutes time. And I have to, uh, my other coach will be very upset with me if I miss that. But well, I, um, I just want to summarize where we got to. Okay. I think my dream in undertaking this podcast, which is a big direction, a uh, big change in direction of what the podcast was previously, which was, you know, bringing together professionals from the fields of behavior analysis and occupational therapy to see if we could talk a common language. Right. And through my extraordinary counsel, I happen to have someone reach out to me who has profoundly impacted my life by the, someone that you know well as well, Bob Washam. And I told him that my journey to precision teaching uh, was a rocky one. I had had exposure to it through, you know, a number of different avenues. And I I just, you know, dream, I wish that those things had come together earlier and this had impacted me earlier in my career and, and the students that I've worked with. Um, but what I was hoping to achieve through this podcast was to tell some extraordinary stories through something that people could listen to that would motivate them to learn more and push themselves to understand the chart, uh, find their way to the chart because that's not an easy journey to take and be inspired by your journey and others um, who profoundly impacted this this field and who now I'm incorporating it into what I do with kids and through uh, my work at Fit Learning and and work with myself now and other people <laughs> and teaching people in the sporting community to use the chart. Um, mm. But I want to acknowledge Bob Washam here because he has been in my life for a few months. It probably feels like a few years to him because I bug him every day with questions <laughs> and he shares. <laughs> and for whatever reason, he keeps responding. And uh, he was the one that said, you know, if you're going to do something profound in your first podcast, you should ask Abigail. Oh. And I was like, I'm too scared. Will you ask her for me? <laughs> <laughs> and he did not. <laughs> well, he did an introductory email to me and right, uh, to right. you for, for me. So I, I, you know, I paired myself with a, a reinforcer. And I want to thank you for sharing to this point. Absolutely. I just want to summarize that, that what I wanted to share with the audience was your extraordinary early life that profoundly impacted you, I believe, mm -hmm. Um Definitely. to make you a, a bold and uh, ahead of your time and brave human being that uh, took on extraordinary challenges outside of your skill set many times <laughs> um, and, outside of, and very much outside of your comfort level, but you took it on. And, and as a result of that work, you eventually, I think, came in contact with some technology and with a, with a, a science right. that helped you understand those things that you had developed on your own and found that had worked and then taught you about this incredible tool that makes us better teachers and better observers right. of behaviour and makes us accountable to the students that we work with. And now this extraordinary ability that you have shared of uh, being able to look at your own behaviour and measure your own behaviour mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. profoundly impact the way that you engage with the world. So I just... Is there something I'm going to beg of you to uh, to reengage with me? Oh, absolutely! <laughs> I, I realise I'm only part so ways. Many of your hours to then talk about your uh, from the Friday to the Monday where you decided to to move to Kansas mm -hmm. and take up your PhD under Og, and um, that he shared your passion for inner behaviour. And uh, the rest is kind of history, but I want to share that history with our audience. So, uh, okay. On that note, I want to thank you so much. You're um, welcome. Thank you for asking. I think I want to have some integrity around this and say when I first uh, reached out to you, I only need an hour of your time. <laughs> <laughs> Mandy, I knew that was not accurate. <laughs> yeah, I had to start measuring my uh, behavior on that, my author's around uh, time that I'm going to take from people but I want to thank you because you've already given me hours and hours of your time and shared resources with me that have already impacted me and um, I know that there's going to be people listening to this that are inspired by your story and your journey and an incredible life through some incredible hardship and now 
what's exciting is, you know, I had a father with epilepsy, but your journey and your ability to take uh, data on your on yourself and then your journey through epilepsy, this is a... Did you just say you have a father, story. you have a father who has epilepsy? I have, yeah, I have a stepfather who had wow. really severe epilepsy, right, who right. was very exposed to that from wow. the age of six. And uh, oh, yeah, my. he fell off a ladder when he was, I believe, 40, just uh, just before he met my mother and, uh, yeah, developed wow. severe epilepsy. And so I observed a, a lot of that from a very early age. So I'm really interested by that. But uh, this is you know, a profound uh, impact um, on your life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And most of your life not having any knowledge of it. So I really want to bring that in the next podcast. So if you will do me that pleasure of uh, opening up that conversation again. Absolutely. You can't really say no, though, can you? I'm asking you in a public forum. <laughs> you what? <laughs> I'm asking you in a public forum because I think at the time of uh, the last podcast, uh, we had you know a following of more than 5,000 people. So you can't exactly say no, can you? <laughs> so, you know, uh, one of the things is having lived with – epilepsy for 70, 72 years or whatever it was, 72 or 73 years, without knowing it, making excuses for my behavior. Now that I have a diagnosis, I am absolutely determined to be public about it because yeah. it's like autism. Well, it's like the learning disabilities. We first found out about learning disabilities we kind of put it off to the side. And emotional problems, we put that off to the side. So we do these things, and I thought, you know what? I do not have severe epilepsy. I've never had a clonic tonic seizure, but I know what epilepsy is like, and I know how it can interfere with your life, and I am determined not to be private about it because... It's just, uh, I mean, th- I think of the soldiers who have come back from world, you know, pro- well, probably from um, Ulysses, t- Odysseus's time, you know, and the the problems that they had with, maybe they died instead of having traumatic brain injury and epilepsy, but they certainly had post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, so all of this across history is, I'm done being private. And I mean, once yeah. I found out, I was I was finished being private. And the only reason why I was private beforehand was, you know, like I may have said to you when I said to the to my epileptologist, "Don't you sometimes see that trees have blue leaves?" <laughs> he turned to me and he said, "No." And I thought, "Okay, <laughs> I am a little bit different." <laughs> I mean, of course I knew that going into his office, but, you know, when he said that, it was like, okay, I still have a few things that I need to take a look at. And, you know, it's taken me about two years, but it's like, this is a different world from what most people live in. The same way you, as the stepdaughter of a man with epilepsy and the mother of a child with autism, you know, it's like, oh, I live in a different world from the quote unquote average person or the quote-unquote yeah. normal person. And, uh, and, you know, going back, though, you had labeled some of these behaviors, correct? I think oh, absolutely. Spontaneous highs. So I, you knew something was, was occurring. And I knew something was not right because other people did not behave that way from the time I was a child. And uh, Well, I think that is a wonderful note to leave the audience hanging on, to learn more about your journey <laughs> in inner behavior your own awareness and how you start and what you started to track and how you're about to impact the medical world with your data. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> That's pretty ambitious. <laughs> yeah. mm. um, and on that note, Dr. Abigail Corkin, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. There are some resources that I'm going to reach out to and I'm going to beg you to come back and do episode two with us if you can find the time. I will do that. I will um, make the time. Mm-hmm. And my deepest heartfelt thanks for sharing your very real journey, which I know is documented elsewhere. Um, but I'm hoping this will be through a podcast, uh, freely available to people that may not pick up your books or find your way to your website. Um, I'll also share those in the show notes too, so they can learn more about your extraordinary journey. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you very much. And I really look forward to taking this conversation again. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.